going to begin this very brief time of worship, uh, remembering some of the events that took place on this spot 350 years ago. We're going to begin by singing praise to God, using the words of the 46th Psalm. The Psalm begins, God is our refuge and our strength. In trouble are sure aid. Therefore, although the earth should move, we will not be afraid. And the events that hit this nation of Scotland 350 years ago were very troublesome. They were very harsh and brutal. And yet, as we shall see, people didn't fear and run away. Many people came here and they bowed their heads before God and they looked into eternity and they received the blessing of the Lord as they stood in this place and their hearts were enlarged as they looked into the face of the Lord whom they would see in an instant. We're going to sing this song of praise to God. It ends, the fifth verse, we'll be singing six verses, it says, the nations rage means they rage against God. They will not accept the sovereign authority of God. The kingdoms moved. And when the earth had heard, the mighty voice went out. The voice of God goes out and all melts at his word. They do not listen. They do not want to hear. And yet when the voice of Christ goes out, that voice has such authority and power that all mankind has to melt at the hear of that voice. Psalm 46, we shall sing praise to God. God is our refuge and our strength in trouble.
thank you that men raged against your kingdom. They declared that your son had no authority and power. And yet, Lord God, in this very spot, you demonstrated the authority and power that you have over men and women's lives. You brought them from death to life. You enable them to live for life in Christ. And then you enable them to face death in Christ. We pray that as we worship you here briefly, as we sing glory to your name in these songs, as we listen to what you would have to say to us concerning these affairs, we pray that you would bless us, that you enlarge our hearts, that you enable us to delight in the Lord God Almighty in his name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. when you look at this period of history, period of history from 1550 through to 1690, there's only one word that really sums it up, and that is astonishing. It's astonishing because of the sheer scale of it. Those of you who were able to go up to the Great Fires Churchyard not sure whether Jimmy had time to take you to the large monument that demonstrates the number of people who were affected and lost their lives in Scotland during that particular latter period known as the Killing Times from 1660 to 1688. But the figure of 18,000 is what's marked on the bottom of that monument. The population in Scotland at that time was 800,000. That's one forty-fifth of the entire population of Scotland. Today, that would represent 123,000 people in Scotland. If you're from Northern Ireland, it would represent 33,000 people. If you're from North America, it would represent seven million people. Seven million people who died during that period or affected during that period. So when people say this was an insignificant little event in the history of Scotland, they show that they are largely ignorant of even the statistical facts concerning this period in time. It's not only astonishing because of the sheer numerical scale, it's astonishing because of the scale of the brutality that was manifest upon ordinary people. Material suffering, fines, they were astronomical, thousands of pounds, tens of thousands of pounds. Some were even fined in terms of today's equivalent money, millions of pounds. It wasn't just that the authorities claimed a little bit of their income. It wasn't merely a taxation of up to 40%. These people were left destitute. The physical suffering is almost unspeakable from the daily harassment of people coming into your home, going through your belongings, taking your animals. Those were everyday occurrences. Then the physical suffering that they endured as individuals. Some of the things that were done to women were truly horrendous. Men suffered immensely. And that's not even to speak of the death that many endured. The mental torture that accompanied all that was going on, the fear, the potential anguish. The catalogue of abuse, when you actually stop and think about it, is truly frightening. We tend to focus on a few individuals. And that's right, and that's necessary enables us to understand the events. There were people like 
John Brown, who was shot on the 1st of May, 1685, in front of his wife and children. His cry was this. He would not declare an oath, deny James Rennick's apologetic declaration. Margaret Wilson, 16. Margaret McLaughlin, 63. Tied to posts in the Solway Firth and the Firth West of Scotland. Margaret Lachlan drowned furthest out. The younger woman drowned near in. Their pride, they would not deny their love for Jesus Christ. George Wood, a young boy of 16, Tinkhorn Hill, the beautiful village of Sorn. He had a Bible on him. Because he had a Bible on him, he was shot dead. Beautiful village, beautiful place. These are but four of the numerous individuals who suffered the consequences of their love for Jesus Christ. I remind you, an equivalent figure of 123,000 in Scotland today, an equivalent figure of 7 million in the United States in today's figures. You've got to ask the question, why did they do it? What was going on to endure such physical suffering? To endure such material suffering, to endure such spiritual suffering. Many of us take lightly the going to the worship of God on the Sabbath day. We go to church often and we don't think a thought about it. And yet these people could go for weeks, months, without a hearing of the Word of God. And when they went to hear the Word of God, they had to go in secret, they had to go at night time. They had to go in disguise. And the only reason they had to do that was because their life was perpetually under threat. Astonishing because of those who were involved. We tend to see these things in life as something that young men get involved in. Young men being stirred by older men. Young men 16, 18, 19, 20. 21, 22, 23, 24. They're up for the fight. These were people of all ages. These were people of all genders, male and female. 16, right through to 68. Men and women, even older. And over a period of decades, it just didn't last a matter of months or years. It went on and on and on. There was no end of it. Why? It makes no sense. Why would a man not protect his wife? Why would he put her into a dangerous situation? Why would a mother not guard her children? Why would she allow them to be put into a dangerous situation? What was going on? Well, the historians of today would tell us that they were fighting for civil and religious freedom. That people could live the way they want to live. That they would have political freedom to decide who would rule over them. That they would have religious liberty to decide that people could worship whoever they want to worship and whatever way they want to worship. It's not true. It's not true. You go back and read the reality of what they said. You go back and look at the old memorial stones. They don't speak of civil and religious liberty. They weren't fighting for people to have the right to live the way they didn't want to live it today. They weren't fighting for people to worship whatever God they wanted to worship today. They were living and they died for one reason and one reason alone. And that was because they loved Jesus Christ. You just have to listen to what they wrote. Read what they wrote. You just have to listen to those who led them. 
the name of the, the last name of the young man on this market stone here is James Rennick. He was 26 years old in three days when he was hanged at this spot. The last time we were here four years ago, I read some of his words. I'm not embarrassed to read some of those words again today. These people desire to hear these words. They long to hear these words. This is what drove these people. This is what gave them a desire to meet the reality of the life that was before them. Rennick says to them, speaking of their love for Jesus, he says, love him and you shall not come short of the enjoyment of him hereafter. It is true, faith is that which is an instrument. It apprehends Christ and it engrafts us in him. Yet it worketh by love. Oh, what shall I say? Love him, love him, love Christ. You cannot bestow your love on any other than Christ. Turn others to the door. Take him as your beloved. And then he speaks to him of why they should love Christ. And he says, Christ's love is pure. Christ's love is sincere. He says, herein is love. Not that we loved him, but that he loved us. And that's the heart of it. These ordinary men and women, these young men and women, these old men and women, they had come to understand something of great importance. They had come to understand that the most important thing in life it's not what they own. It wasn't the possession they held. It wasn't where they lived. It wasn't who their friends were. It wasn't what they enjoyed in life. They had come to understand that there was one who loved them. One who loved them supremely. One called Jesus Christ. And that man, Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, 2,000 years ago, laid down his life as a sacrifice for sin. He laid down his life that those who by the grace of God would come to an understanding of their sin, would come to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And these men and women didn't see this as religion. They didn't see this as some philosophy. They came to understand it because he loved them. David loved him. And because he loved him with all his heart, David loved him. And because he loved them with his life, David loved him with their lives. When men came knocking on their doors and said, This change in religion is a small thing. A small thing. They said no. Because it concerns our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's no small thing. This is no tinkering at the small ages of religion. This deals with the heart of eternal matters. This goes to the sovereignty of God. This goes to the kingship and the authority of Jesus Christ. And it is not a small thing. And so faced with death or faced with honouring Jesus Christ, they held up Jesus Christ and they believed in Jesus Christ. They listened to Renick as he said, Jesus Christ's love is an enriching love. For those upon whom his love is bestowed are no more poor. How can they be poor who have Christ for riches? All things are yours, yet ye are Christ's, and Christ is yours. Now hear this. If you have this love of Christ bestowed on you, then all other things 
are made to serve your good. Ye shall lack nothing. Ye shall lack nothing. And on that day, when Richard Cameron, or James Rennick, faced his death, and he came to this place to die, he didn't tremble in fear. It wasn't a case of being a broken man. It wasn't a case of thinking, I've lived 26 years and what have I achieved? I've achieved nothing. I've achieved nothing. People have died because of what I preached. He didn't ascend the steps, they say. My life has been a waste. When he ascended the steps, he looked into the eyes of the eternity God and he said, I welcome what awaits me. I look forward to seeing my Saviour this day. I look forward and I welcome that which lies before me. Come as the are, come as the man. That's a challenge that lies before us today. You've walked around the sites. But the question is, are you prepared to die? like James Rennick. That's not the issue. It's not the issue. The issue is, are you prepared because of the love of Jesus Christ and his death for you? Are you prepared to die for Jesus Christ by living for Jesus Christ every single day of your life? Are you prepared to live for Jesus Christ every single day of your life? And one day the heavenly angels will come and they will clap in glory and the Lord of hosts will come and all will stand and there will be a great sound and all mankind will know that those who have lived for Christ have lived the life of love for the one who is the King of Kings who will reign for all eternity regardless of what men say or regardless of what men think, or regardless of what men do. We have a Saviour in Jesus Christ, the living God. We believe in Him. Will we walk for Him? Will you walk for Him? Will you speak for Him? Will you live for Him? Now we're going to sing to His glory. We'll sing the last song, Psalm 24. The worst the world and the riches with which it is stored. And then the last two verses. O gates, lift up your heads. Ages, doors, lift them up. The King of glory to enter draws us now. The King of glory enters to draw us. Is this going to happen? That's a question. Is this going to happen? Is this going to happen? Yes. This is going to happen. This is actually going to happen. Let's sing it as though we believe that this is going to happen because this is real and this is true.
song of today. We've heard of these lives. This has been real. We often think that reality is what we see on the television and what we read in the newspapers. And that is real. And yet, Lord God, what we've heard about Christ this day, what we've heard about his love for his people this day, what we've heard about his death this day, what we've heard about his resurrection and the sitting at your right hand and the fact that he will return as the great king of glory. That is as real. And we pray, Lord God, that you would give us the confidence to believe that this is real and to live this way, to live, Lord Jesus, humbly, but to live confidently and to speak of the reality of our Savior and to speak of Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.